All right. That was a bit of a quick change. Um, pit stop. Uh, this is the session on policy. <laughs> and my name is Naomi Stead, and it is my very great pleasure to be your chair for this afternoon session from the top, The Potential of Policy. We have a really fascinating group of women on the panel, each with quite distinct interests and engagements with policy, why it matters, how it works, how it doesn't work sometimes, and how it can be made to work more effectively towards more, a more equitable, diverse and inclusive architecture profession. I must say that, um, as Justine mentioned this morning, she invited me to chair this session because I have a particular fascination for policy, um, as an amateur kind of uh, fascination. And I hope that one day someone might call me a wonk, which is that, you know, that strange word they only ever use in relation to policy, a wonk. <laughs> um, but I've been <laughs> reflecting on why, I, what, what it is that I find compelling about policy and why I believe in, believe in its power and whether it could be perhaps the collectiveness of the umbrella of policy, its effect on communality, it's bringing people together, potentially, ideally, uh, or perhaps it's, its orderliness and its structure and the clarity and transparency of explicit parameters and frameworks, the sense of everybody knowing exactly where they stand. But ultimately, I think it's this, the sense of be both an organisation and an individual knowing their obligations but also their rights, the agreed rules or law which say what can be rightfully claimed and demanded and the consequences or recourse if that promise is not fulfilled. Because for me, I think that this is what policy can or should provide, the kind of rules of engagement between the top, <laughs> top and the grassroots, working to work together towards a more equitable world. It should, policy should, give collective strength and recourse to individuals. It should give precision and accountability to organisations. It should set a course and help everyone to navigate towards that. But of course, it doesn't always work that way. And I'm looking forward to hearing about some of the complexities and failings of policy from our panellists, as well as their hopes for what it might achieve, achieve and how. So first, I'm going to very briefly introduce our panellists, and then they're each going to give a short five-minute-ish um, presentation of what work they've been doing in this area and uh, their particular interest in this area. Um, and also on the related question of institutional and organisational leadership from the top. So... Um, you'll tell us what you do and why. And this introduction will be followed by a panel discussion of approximately 45 minutes. Then we'll open to questions from the floor and finish at 4 p.m. Our panellists in order are Amy Muir, the president of the Victorian chapter of the Australian Institute of Architects, who has been active in using the Institute's gender equity policy as leverage for change as an elected representative. She is now on the committee that is charged with delivering on that policy and has initiated a review of the policy in her role on National Council. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not on the committee. I'm not on the gender committee, not but certainly on National Council supporting change. Very good. Jocelyn Chu is the chair of the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects, or AILA's Gender Equity Working Group, which currently has a major program of action underway. Jocelyn is also manager, campus design, quality and planning at Monash University, my own institution, so she brings a client-side perspective also to the conversation. Natalie Galea is an academic with a background in construction management at the University of New South Wales. Um, Natalie has done wonderful work looking at the update and effectiveness of equity policy within large construction companies and is very articulate about what needs to happen for policy to gain traction. She's also the genius behind the Gender on the Tender campaign, mm -hmm. which creates a framework for embedding gender equity within the procurement process from the very beginning. I hope we will hear more about that. At the end, Emily Grandstaff Rice is a, an experienced advocate, leader, and policymaker in the US context, where the American Institute of Architects has a long history of equity policies and initiatives stretching back until at least 1968. Emily was the chair of the year-long Equity and Architecture Commission, which delivered its recommendations to the American Institute of Architects Board in 2016. One of the recommendations was to make a board-level committee to track ongoing progress in perpetuity. This committee is named the Equity and the Future of Architecture Committee, and Emily has chaired it since 2016 and will continue until December next year. She has also been instrumental in establishing the AIA Women's Leadership Summit and the AIA Guides for Equitable Practice, which we've seen earlier, which take Parler's own guides as a model. 
but expands them beyond gender to take better account of other underrepresented groups according to ethnicity, race, ability, LGBTIQ plus status, non-binary status, ability, and so on. It's fair to say that Emily has been centrally involved in the development and delivery of equity, diversity, and inclusion policy in architecture in the US, and the latest Women's Leadership Summit in September had around 700 attendees, which she believes is the largest ever gathering of women architects. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> We're guessing. It might be a pretty safe guess. Yes. Um, so each of the panelists is going to introduce themselves um, for five minutes, strictly. Um, and we don't have a particular order, so perhaps we'll just proceed. All right. Um, I, I was sort of um, last night and this morning thinking about what are some of the little things that you have in your life. I think all of these issues and advocacy and policy, at the end of the day, what is fascinating about the world we live in, everyone comes to a position from a very different background and a very different context and a very different history. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, these, these spaces are incredibly complex. But I was just sort of reflecting on some of, you know, some of the things that hap have happened in my life that have been little points. And um, I was uh, remembering one of the first points, you know, sort of growing up, uh, you know, a younger sister, a mother and a father, a father who was, uh, never mentioned the fact that we were girls, you know, it just was a thing. Um, but being in year eight, and I was at a co-ed school, very small co-ed school, um, and we were, uh, that term, looking at Lord of the Flies. And each English class, the, um, we were to read from Lord of the Flies, and because every character was a male character, only the boys in the class got to read. And so we, we were going to have to deal with that for a whole term. And I think I got to about, probably, I'm, from memory, I think I probably got to about week three. And I was never, you know, I never really sort of said much, but I just put my hand up and I said, is there going to be an opportunity for us to mix this thing up a bit and, you know, to have a bit of a go? And it was made very clear, no, you, you're female, so there are no female parts in this book. Um, so this is it. And I think, um, after a couple more weeks, I must have said it again, um, just because I was starting to get a little bit fed up, and got sent to the principal's office. And I think that was probably the first time that it started to dawn on me that you do actually have to say things, and also quite shocked that there wasn't an alternative. Um, and then I think moving through, you know, um, in my first um, interview when I finished Year 12, um, going into an interior design interview, and um, that was in 1993, and I was interviewed by six males, yet the course was 80% female, 20% male. And so it was, once again, it was just sort of this skewed, and I'd come, you know, in the last few years of my education, had been in an all-girls school where, once again, never questioned, you were never told that you were female and that you had to um, excel in a particular way, you were just completely supported um, through an education and it wasn't, it wasn't a gender education, it was an education. And so these sort of little blips that sort of pop up in life, I think, are, are really um, sort of fascinating views of other people's worlds or your world and how you're sort of sitting within it. And then I think I was sort of remembering as well, you know, um, uh, in, at the end, that's right, at the end of the architecture um, course, I was given an award which was the Association of Women in Architecture Prize and I was horrified, I was totally mortified and at that time, this is 2002 and I mean, now I look back on it, that was an incredibly naive response but I was um, mortified that I couldn't be recognised as a person for, um, you know, in terms of from a professional point of view. Anyway, and I think, you know, we all have experienced various things in our profession, but I was just reflecting as well on um, Alison Cleary, who you was just sitting in this seat a moment ago, um, who was the um, a manager at, um, of the Victorian chapter, and in 2012 asked me to join the awards committee. And Alison was a huge champion of women and gender equity, and the you know the committees very much were supporting 50/50, and it was really interesting because I got onto that committee in 2012, and it was 50 you know there were three males, three females within the the committee. However, I realised very quickly one of our tasks on that awards committee is to work out who the jurors are going to be for the the awards, and in the juries we have 14 categories, three jurors per. Um, category. And there were, uh, despite our 
committee, there were only 85%, well, not only, there were 85% of those chair jury roles were dedicated to men. And so it became very evident that we had a complete imbalance in our representation on juries. And so that we started, and it wasn't through anyone not thinking, you know, not thinking that that wasn't a good or a bad thing. It just wasn't a thing. It just wasn't being talked about. And so I think we started, you know, really talking about it and ensuring that, you know, each year we were committing to lifting the bar. And in 2018, I think we had... Um, 50-50, male-female for um, the uh, chair roles, and I think we got to 47% females across the board, 53 um, males. And then the following year, this year, 2019, same thing, 50-50, but we ended up with 55 females versus 45 males. So it was just, uh, I think, these sort of little exercises, and I think, you know, we sort of talk about standing up, and I'll talk more about that when we go into sort of talking more broadly about policy, but how do we stand up? How do we go about doing that? Um, you know, this sort of idea of a conversation about something and reminding people and constantly being sort of on on call. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Fabulous. Thank you. Do we clap after each? Now let's just keep no, going. Keep Jocelyn. Going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, look, I'm, I'm coming through to this from a bit of a strange vantage point, I guess. I've grown up with um, Chinese Malaysian parents who have never been to China and have also spent most of their life here now in Australia. Um, a lot of my childhood was spent doing a lot of outdoor sports, mountain biking, et cetera, et cetera, with male, generally male um, friends. Um, so I was very used to, have it, to, to um, interacting with males and females, but generally in a sport-based activity. So that meant a lot of doing and not a lot of talking. <laughs> so I've spent a lot of my sort of um, more recent recent um, professional life, I guess trying to work out what my voice is and actually opinion, uh, you know, giving that some action. Um, I've learnt that it's not enough just to work really hard. Mm. Uh, to be seen, you have to be heard. Um, and so that's what I've spent quite a bit of time on doing. Um, and that's, I guess, part of the driver between, a bit behind the work that I'm doing now at Monash University, but also for AILA. So at Monash University, I've been responsible for the last, last nine years for implementing um, uh, the master plan vision for Caulfield and Clayton campuses. And this, this is now extended um, based on of the success of that over to our Parkville and Peninsula campuses. Um, at the time that I started working at Monash, Design wasn't a part of our language. I work in the Buildings and Property Division. Um, it's very project manager oriented, um, time, budget, delivery. And so a lot of you know, our, our work has been around um, asking the question, what are we delivering as an expert service? What is the, you know, what are we doing that's contributing to the um, estate? And so this is where my, because this is a, a session on policy, I want to just qualify that I don't actually have specific um, delivered experience in gender equity policy yet. Um, I'll come to that in a sec. But um, so my experience in delivered policy is around design. And at Monash University, we've introduced a, um, a master plan that sets out a vision for each campus. Um, we developed a tagline to bring everyone along on the journey. Someone said in one of the sessions this morning that narrative is important. I can't emphasise that more. You know, it is really, really important, especially when you're talking to non-architects who m may not understand design and, frankly, don't understand the benefit of it, and all they can see is cost and time and uh, um, and difficulty, I guess. So ch challenge, um, uh, especially where we're sort of, you know, uh, advocating for co-design processes. Mm -hmm. So lots of different voices. So. Um, as part of the master plan implementation, we said that the story behind the master plans is that we're working towards this vision that benefits everyone. Every piece of work you do, whether it's strategic or operational, whether you're a dean or whether you're a plumber, whether you're installing exposed piping or whether it's a new building, that contributes to the master plan vision. And so we need to make sure that we're interrogating it enough and making sure that it is actually contributing and not detracting from you know, getting to that place that we need to be. And so over the last 10 years, we've actually you know, created environments, campuses that are much more, um, much more um, inclusive, much more attractive, and much more welcoming, much more transparent, 
and connected um, and um, are hopefully much more enjoyable with seeing more people on them. And they've been supported by policies for architectural selection, uh, for design review, for design approval, for public art um, and for memorials as well. That's been our most recent one. Um, with Ayla, um, Ayla commissioned a census report similar to the architectural one that was that Justine and Naomi spoke about this morning. Um, and that census report identified a number of issues with, um, with the landscape architecture profession at the moment in the area of gender equity. And so this year we set up a um, a working group and I chair that working group and we've got a number of really wonderful men members inputting to that from all around the country. And we've drafted a, um, well, I should say that building on Jill Gillian's um, um, census report and her next steps report, we've augmented that next steps report. So that that's that those two reports were written by Gillian and produced by Parler and, um, and XY, well, the sec, are both by XYX Live and Parler? No. Yes. Okay. And ah. yes. <laughs> okay. And then um, and Ayla's commissioned those. Um, and so we've augmented the um, the next steps report with um, how that might be delivered. Um, and we've also drafted a policy, and we're hoping to release that to members in the the coming weeks, certainly before Christmas. I hope. <laughs> um, and I guess that's yeah. That's about it for me for now. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Jocelyn. Natalie. Yeah, hi. Um, my story starts as well with sport. Um, I'm on my third career currently. There may be more in the future. But um, my first career was as an Olympic athlete and then my second was as a construction project manager um, and my third is now as an academic and I often joke to industry that I've had a steep decline in legitimacy. <laughs> <laughs> um, my... Sporting career was interesting. I knew exactly what I needed to do as a judo player to get to that podium, to get to the gold medal. But I spent about, you know, 15, 17 years in my construction career scratching my head, being the only woman um, in the room and not knowing how I was to progress because hard work, despite the fact that I put in a great amount of effort, was not paying off. Um, I did what I thought I had to do. I moved overseas. Um, I, you know, I tried to follow suit and it really didn't get me too far. So um, in about 2012, um, as luck would have it, I went for a cut and colour at the hairdresser in Dubai <laughs> and long story short, met my supervisor that way and we got an ARC research um, grant out of a research project that looked at um, why it was in um, the construction sector that... Um, despite this sort of raised awareness of gender equality and a lot of big construction companies having a very well-developed set of suite of policies, why it was that women's participation rate was stalling, if not going backwards, and, you know, what was beneath that. And I think going back to my sporting analysis, the rules of the game are really important. And um, certainly in our research um, project, we started out and we analysed two large T1 contractors suite of policies and importantly probably the thing we didn't analyse until we got to site was that contract and that's still an important formal rule but the other thing is the importance of the informal rules that happen um, on those sites and, and how they often bump against or trump and interact with some of those formal policies and I think I'm having a hoop hearing <laughs> issue as well. Um, so I think from our um, research perspective, I mean, we spent a lot of time giving feedback to the sector. Um, in short, we found that um, the policies that um, were being in place were sitting in isolation at the head office and they actually weren't taking into consideration the practices on a construction site. They, they were effectively, companies were treating um, you know, how they budgeted for and human or didn't humanly resource their projects, but how they carried on and conducted their construction business as gender neutral and not having any gendered effects. Um, and so for the sh in, in short, most of those policies were focused on fixing women rather than actually addressing the um, or recognising that the rules in use were gendered or had gendered effects or had unintended consequences. And that ranged from everything from 
how they budgeted projects in terms, particularly, say, for instance, parental leave, if it was a group cost or a, um, or a project cost. If it was a project cost, there was enormous backlash to anybody going on to parental leave. Um, and also things like, you know, whether you, how you costed up IT, for instance. Um, these all had gendered implications. And so um, from that research, it was really interesting to see how, you know, you have very different formal and informal rules in use that maintain male powerfulness and over-representation in the construction sector and undermine um, the... The, I guess the author's intentions of those policies. Um, and I just will add to your point about leadership, um, if I can be quite direct, <laughs> which I have a habit of being, um, there was a real culture of denial amongst um, an indifference, I would say, amongst senior leaders, a lack of understanding and um, certainly um, a lack of ownership. And this is really important because in construction, the policies were often authored by HR people who had very little power. Mm -hmm. The power rested with the operational people, the very people who didn't have buy-in into gender equality. So that sort of summarises where I'm at. I'm still working in the construction area more, now in the wellbeing space um, and also in the human rights area. Thank you. Excellent. Emily. So I was struck when you said, you know, what do you do and why? Um, I think I'm a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. um, why? Because it needs to be done <laughs> sometimes. Um, I am on the board of directors of the AIA and there's sort of an interesting story of how that happened. But I do want to make one correction in that, um, you know, the AIA is not perfect. Um, and we have a long way to go in terms of policy that really welcomes and is inclusive to all. Um, you know, I think in 1968, the defining moment was when Dr. Whitney Young, a civil rights leader, came to the AIA and at their convention said, um, you distinguish yourself by your thunderous silence on civil rights. And frankly, I think it's taken us 40 plus years to even really wake up to that. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and um, it's my honor and privilege to, to play a small role in that. So. Um, in 2015, uh, there was a member resolution at the annual um, meeting to put AI's feet to the fire regarding diversity and inclusion. Um, and there, I, there's been a lot of um, really interesting um, trigger phrases for me today, um, and I don't think we'll have time to go into all of them. But just as one example, um, the AI didn't collect gender data um, until 1994. Um, and I can talk about why that was good, why that was bad as well. Um, and so that kicked off the Equity and Architecture Commission and that was a group of 16 um, subject matter experts across the country of um, different abilities, genders, viewpoints, um, orientation, uh, and, and frankly also experience uh, on the spectrum of what it means to be um, woke or aware of uh, all of the issues out there. And we took our time, we took about a year, and instead of looking at sort of how could we could fix the problem, it was more in terms of the orientation of what could increased equity, diversity, and inclusion look like in the profession, and what are the impacts that that could have, and really walk backwards about how we could start to begin to change the culture. Um, I say this often, I recognize this will not happen within my lifetime. Um, Despina Stradagakos' book will say, you know, in U.S. culture, we won't reach gender parity in architecture until 2090. Well, that's like the most depressing thing <laughs> ever to read on the subway. But here we are. <laughs> and, um, but it is important for us to act and it's important for us to take one step in front of the other. Um, on that uh, committee, some of the things that we looked at were just really basic stuff. One, um, and we call it diversity inclusion, uh, sorry, we call it equity, diversity, inclusion, diversity to have a mix, inclusion to make sure that that mix is well managed and so that people are welcome, right? It's not enough to just have a mix, but you also need to create the right environment and also equity, understanding that people come to the table with different needs and how, as a professional organization, you can support them. Um, we did quickly joke that um, we can't call it diversity, inclusion, and equity because then, then it would be die. <laughs> and that would be really embarrassing. So, um, uh, 
setting up um, measures so that this initiative would always tie back to the leadership of the organization. Uh, Marion Wright Edelman, you can't be what you can't see, making sure that um, instead of using stock images on the website, we all know those were like someone's pointing to the blueprint with their hard hat, <laughs> right? Um, and actually going in and taking real photographs of, oh my gosh, real architects, um, ranging to um, starting to collect a lot of data and measure that data and be rigorous about that. Um, and um, Firm self-assessments, we're still going to work on a research paper, um, that's TBD. Um, it, the funding is there, we just need to put the measures out for it. But um, perhaps the most impactful thing has been uh, the e Guides for Equitable Practice, which were influenced by Parlour's amazing work. And I can't tell you how, mu how grateful we are that uh, you led the way in that because it gave us a pathway to start to talk about why this is important and, and really um, create um, guides for what we felt was important in our culture. Um, and it also struck a chord in that the conversation for a more equitable pra um, profession has to not get, fall into specific buckets. In other words, it couldn't be just about gender. It had to be about the larger diaspora of everyone's experience um, and individual experience and how the intersectionality of that works. Um, and um, that's sort of a really uh, exciting place for me to be now, um, thinking about um, ranges of abil abilities, ranges of experience, ranges of culture. Mm. Well, Emily, maybe we'll start with a question to you then about how the guides have been received. They can't quite remember when they were released. So we, we did them in waves. Okay, so number one, you guys wrote so well, the pressure was on. <laughs> so we wanted to do it. Um, and there seems to be this ethos in, in the AIA that we can do it all by ourselves, just make a committee or a task force, and it'll get done. Oh, God, no. So... Um, Number one, we knew that the importance of this was critical. So we found a research partner in the University of Minnesota and now the University of Washington. So the f key first part was to get an academic partner who could write it in a way that would speak both to individuals, um, to firms, and the profession at large. Um, and we released three at a time. So our first three came out in March. Our second three came out this summer. Um, and then our last three will be coming out November, well, it is November, November, soon. <laughs> soon. They're in final copy. Um, and, and then I think that we keep talking about this chapter 10. Uh, what we recognized is that because we focused on the profession so much, um, we, re we really didn't bring in the student voice. So working in which we can have that conversation with um, the American Colleges and Schools of Architecture, as well as our accrediting um, organizations, and um, one of the things that struck me um, recently was in a conversation about um, professional organizations and why they exist. And I'm still struggling with this, so bear with me for a second. Professional organizations by their nature um, are, are in a way reinforced dominant culture, right? So to be a professional, what does that mean? Right? There's usually credentials, there's education, there's a certain status that one has to hold to be part of this community. Um, and as a result, I think it also comes with the baggage, especially because architecture and design is something that you learn from others, you don't learn from a book. It reinforces um, patterns of behavior um, that um, have existed for you know, over 100 years. Right? And that's a really hard juggernaut to try and, um, I have this image of a peeling onion, um, to sort of peel away the layers to get at how you can change. Uh, and just having the basic conversation about cultural competency and implicit bias has been critical for us, which is why our guides lead with that. Mm -hmm. Because we can't start to talk about pay equity, negotiation, um, and, and, building equitable communities until we have that initial basic foundation of why diversity and inclusion is important. And so I think that that has been an interesting viewpoint um, to explore. Mm. 
and I'll be so glad when they're done. Um, not because I'm moving on, but because it allows me to have a bigger conversation about how it gets put in practice. Mm -hmm. And I will say one of the negative things has been, so there's been positive things. One of the negative things is that people read them and they go like, well, this is really heavy. Right, so sometimes... Um, when you say heavy, do you mean as in depressing or...? Both, Dan. right? So I don't want to read 30 pages on implicit bias or whatever that is. Just give me the cliff notes. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough conversation um, because there's a lot to unpack there. So I think that's what we're working through right now. And that's our, that's our immediate challenge. Now that the first ones are out, the f early adopters are excited. But how do we start to peel those layers away mm. <laughs> to get at the bigger picture of, of how do we truly change the outlook of the profession? Well, and I guess, I mean, Natalie, you were talking about um, the informal rules, because I guess the thing about policy is that it's, it's a formal, clear, explicit framework, but the it can be very easily undone by unspoken um, ambiguities and also informal rules. And I guess it's absolutely the same in architecture as it is in the construction industry. Um, so, uh, well, first of all, do you want to talk about that a little bit more, especially perhaps in relation to your gender on the tender initiative? Yeah, I, I think the other thing is too, there's what we found was there's a lot of um, forgetting the new and remembering the old, particularly around those norms. And a lot of the norms we found were gendered. But in terms of moving to gender on the tender, what became apparent after we did enormous consultation with a lot of the construction sector is that we found that it's very difficult um, I'll rephrase that. Construction sits like architecture in an ecosystem. It's in a life cycle. And by the time you're trying to impose, say, flexibility policies or for new formal rules onto a construction site, you know, they've already been squeezed. Their margins are at five, three percent. They've resourced, you know, they've resourced poorly often or they haven't resourced for flexibility at all, part-time jobs. So what we realised is that, well, um, that... Um, we had to be talking further up the food chain um, at an earlier in the in the life cycle um, at the tender stage. And um, yeah, I coined the term gender on tender. It's a bit like, um, what is it called? Um, oh, social um, procurement? Or, but anyway, it's snappier because it's gender on the I'm tender. I'm trying to get the idea of not putting a woman on a dollar bill. Yeah, well, <laughs> this is one of the downsides of gender on the tender is my... Um, my understanding of it is that men have gender too. Novel, I know. <laughs> um, but um, that's been one of the challenges is that when people hear the term gender, they just think we're talking about targets and recruiting women. But it's much more than that. It's about considering how are you tendering your project? Are you allowing for contractors to employ part-time shared roles? Um, are you thinking about the well-being of the workers on site? Because one of the shocking things for me from the, um, our research project was that on my first day of shadowing a construction professional, it was a senior superintendent, and by Smoko, which is morning tea for those who aren't Australian in the room, he was telling me on the way to coffee that he has a panic attack most mornings on the way into work. And that he has, you know, his drinking's increased, um, so, you know, and the construction's known for um, height and substance abuse. And, but he was lucky, you know, he's still married. So um, the, what happened was that there's this, what happened to us is we set out to study women, but we ended up speaking a lot, of time, lot, lot to men, particularly about their well-being and health. And so going back to gender on the tender, the thought is to really have clients and financiers and um, even designers consider how what, what the implications of their, their project design is on the people who are doing the building work. And to have maybe some measures in place, like um, counting the number of, I know this is morbid, but counting the number of suicides that occur on your site. Because data, you know, what gets counted counts. And similarly, the retention rate of women, but also looking at how are you delivering your job? Are you delivering it on a five-day work week or are you just doing the norm, which is a six-day creeping to a seven-day? Um, so, um, yeah, we've put forward this idea to government and, I mean, it's exciting. The Green Building Council have intimated to us that they will start looking at social um, sustainability in terms of their points now in the revised new Green um, Star. So that is somewhat considering... Um, 
you know, the people who are building those jobs at the early stage. And we're hoping to build, we've got some traction, there is some um, state task force, cultural task force, that are looking at procurement as a way to really leverage and shift change in the sector. But what I will say is there is still resistance. And the, one of the saddest things that was said to me recently by somebody who works for a developer is, you know, I just don't think that it's so far down the food chain, we can't see the harm that's being done to humans on these sites. So we're not, you know, they're not willing to then reconsider the time and cost boundaries in their tenders. So I think, you know, government needs to lead on it and then hopefully private sector will follow suit and live their true values. <laughs> It's fascinating that you mentioned that when, you know, when people see the word gender, they think targets. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, something I guess we're, we're familiar with. But, and targets obviously is a fairly, you know, contentious kind of, um, there's certainly differing opinions on targets. Mm. But Amy, am I right in thinking that you found the um, Australian Institute of Architects Gender Equity Policy very useful in that regard? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I had a situation last year, I've never sort of, thought about. I knew that, I mean, the policy was introduced in 2013 um, with a huge amount of work um, with Parler and the Institute and, you know, an extraordinary number of people, members who've contributed their time to that over the years. And um, I always knew that it was there, but I'd never sort of thought about it. And um, I, uh, in my role last year, I came up against a situation where we were asked as the Institute to endorse a speakers program that was part of, you know, that was being um, uh, supported by the government. And um, we were given this, the speaker list and it was all men. And at that stage, I think 50% of the speakers had been confirmed it was all men. And so very quickly we sort of sat down and said, look, we don't sort of think this is going to really work. Um, how can we fix this? And there was sort of a bit of, uh, well, yeah, we'll try. And so I remember I gave Michael Smith the call and I just said, OK, I've read the policy, but there's nothing definitive in it that I feel like I can. there's a line in the sand that I'm going to be able to sort of stand up to. What, what do you reckon it is based on the policy? And, and I think we sort of said, oh, 30%. And so I, I knew that I had to have a number that I was going to start negotiating with or else I wasn't going to necessarily get anywhere. And that went on for, I think it was four or five months. Um, and twice I pulled the pin on our endorsement and it was, um, it was a very confronting thing. I'd never sort of dealt with that before and particularly given that it was government, we didn't, I didn't, I mean, it was a, you know, a reputational thing um, as well. And, I, and at times, I think this is the other problem as well, at times you feel like you don't know whether you're overstepping the line. And, and I think I felt like the policy was so great being able to say, we've got a policy. And it was really interesting sitting in the room with a whole lot of people are like, well, we don't have a policy, so we don't really have an opinion about this. And I thought, well, I think we all need an opinion about this. <laughs> but it was really interesting, the power of the policy, how that could be used as a tool to leverage something and to have a really rock solid conversation about something and to say, well, I can't go beyond this line. And I think as a result of that um, sort of came back to National Council and said, look, you know, and there was work happening in the background with the Gender Equity um, Committee, but we need to put in place some really rigorous um, quotas, and I never believed in quotas either until that I had to deal with that situation. I just went, we have to be having, we have to have quotas. Um, and so, and I was going to say, um, Samina, just with this, I, I feel like I'm about to fall into a conversation which I don't really want to have, but we, um, we've just supported a 40-40-20, um, and that being 40, male, uh, 40 female, 40 male, and um, 20, as we say, either male or female or non-binary. And I was thinking maybe with this forward slash thing, maybe it should be 40, 20, 40, and we don't put the 20 at the end, but maybe that's another conversation. But I think it was, it was just a, it was a really good example as to how powerful a policy can be, and then sort of strengthening that. And I had another situation several months ago um, 
uh, where I was asked to be on a jury, once again government, and um, I was asking who was on the jury and I was told who was on the jury, so I thought I was, it was all good. And then was having a conversation and then some more names came up and I was like, oh, that sounds like there's more than three people on that jury and there were six. And I said, oh, it sounds like I'm the only female on that jury. And I said, I'm so sorry, but I'm not going to be able to participate because we have this policy. And I said, I suspect you probably have one too. Um, and then got an email 30 minutes later saying, all chains, all good. And so it was, and so I just think, you know, there's something incredibly powerful about that. And, you know, and I, I thought it was interesting, you know, this angry, you know, when do we, and, you know, in, in the background, you know, what do we do? But this sort of thing of, um, you know, words, um, action, how do, we, how do we stand on our own two feet? And, um, you know, the idea of being able to action through being supported by something. And policy is so incredibly important. Um, when they're just, it's like the rules in the game. If we have rules, then we all know where we stand. And then it's like, no questions asked, that's that. Um, and however, you know, I would say that we're in an incredibly important time in terms of diversity and, um, you know, and, and in terms of how we sort of start to talk about inclusion um, and, you know, that is, that is you know, there, there's a huge amount of um, uh, intelligence that needs to be brought to the table uh, that I feel that at the moment, you know, we're obviously at the Institute, there's, you know, the, um, the Gender Equity Committee is um, starting to um, go full steam ahead with that over the next six months to be able to establish a diversity and um, uh, um, equity and, yes, all the, every, including everything. Um, but I, I think, you know, and also obviously introducing the RAP is incredibly important and that was supported by National Council um, this year. So there's a whole lot of things that um, National Council are really supporting. But what, interestingly enough, we met with National Council the other day and this 40-2040 was um, uh, put in dispute uh, because we had a situation earlier in the year where we had a 50-50 split on our board, on the national board, and then um, there were um, basically the elections came in and we ended up with too many females. And so an um, incredibly valuable female had to step down. And so we're actually now having to, that 40, 2040, we're having to reassess how we actually word it so that there can be um, an ability to be able to um, not lose valuable females when we've... Um, mm in terms of, um, yeah, corporate knowledge, etc. So mm. I think there's, there's, yeah, so how do you go about allowing for these variances? Um, I also think the language is important. When we did the briefing paper for the um, gender on the tender, we termed it in, ta in terms of targets on men. Mm. Um, because I think the other thing is too, whilst we keep the conversation on women, it does just keep the conversation as an issue for women to fix and about women. And it's actually much more than that. Mm. Mm. So, well done on mm. the 40, 40, 20, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, 40, 20, 40, I think that's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the, the revisions of the mm. um, um, Institute Policy, mm. Australian Institute of Architects Policy now actually is, you know, follows, you know, now we're following you. Yeah, you I, I was about to say, I feel like we're now like, heading We're all in this together. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, <laughs> and I think, you know, and, and it's just acknowledging that, you know, it's, you know, what do we what do we participate in and being very explicit about that and just saying let's all just do it together and you know and be very upfront about it and very transparent and you know and I, and I think you know the institute at the moment is undertaking a whole lot of work in relation to novation as well so you know this health and well-being is incredibly important mm -hmm. in terms of how we understand the workplace how we understand the industry at large in order to be able to support a much more transparent and even playing field and I think all of that is playing, it's, it's all the same conversation, really. Mm. Mm, absolutely. Jocelyn, you were talking a little bit when, in your introduction about um, both the work that you've been doing as part of AILA to mm. um, embark on a program of activity to improve gender equity. Um, but also you were talking about advocacy for design in the context of Monash and in <laughs> terms of procurement. I mean, is there, is there something interesting for you here in the, you know, do, can we have gender on the tender at Monash? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm going, it's going to be the first thing I Google when I get <laughs> home. 
<laughs> so it's something that we've been wanting to get to for some time and we've been sort of, uh, we've got an architect selection committee, um, we've got the University Architect Shelley Penn on that, the Dean of Architecture Shane Murray on that and um, so we're the three core members and so we've talked about it informally for some time and we've affected it informally some of that change so we've seen a lot more sort of female-led practices coming into Monash to deliver work this is uh, consultancy work we haven't it hasn't sort of um, been formalized yet and that's something that we're working on doing at the moment um, um, and, and of course the next evolution of that would be then influencing our colleagues in um, in project you know in project delivery to carry that through to contractor um, engagement and selection but we have thought a bit about the sort of health impacts of design and the sort of palettes that we're specifying for our landscapes and our buildings so we've I, I won't say we've, we've come anywhere near close to solving it, but it's certainly right at the forefront of our minds. What is the um, health and physical impact of the, the sort of environments that we're asking people to, to design and deliver? Yeah. It's, um, uh, we should probably also acknowledge the work that Ellie Giannini has been doing over many years advocating mm. for, you know, um, uh, consideration of gender in procurement in the university context and elsewhere, and certainly on big projects. I don't know whether Ellie's here, but she's really been a leader in that regard. And it also strikes me as interesting that um, advocacy and indeed activism around procurement is seems to me now becoming much more pronounced around sustainability and climate change. Mm. And that, you know, obviously, let's hope all of us are um, sustainability activists, um, but it seems to me that it's it's very interesting to see how there's a kind of new wave of um, let's say, ingeniousness in the way that people are trying to kind of burrow their way into large institutions and have an impact on questions like sustainability around procurement. I mean, is that, can, you, can you draw a comment on that at all? Well, I think, um, I think you've phrased it in a really beautiful kind of idealistic sort of way. And I think at the moment we've seen that um, environmental approach, uh, well, an environmental approach to the built environment, that doesn't even really make sense, but a sustainability approach to the built environment has um, got a monetary value now. Like people aren't interested in supporting businesses that are not sustainable and they're not interested in, you know, attending universities that also aren't sustainable. So I, th I think we have, and also universities aren't interested anymore in um, investing in infrastructures that they then, um, that will then outdate and that we can't sort of maintain um, in the long run. So I think there's a, a vested interest all around, um, let alone the whole livability and, you know, our, uh, can we actually live on the planet that we're sort of contributing to? Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that vested interest in s making sure that we're all contributing to a future that is, is sustainable. Um, so I, I think that's a lot of what's driving it. But um, there's also, you know, multiple other benefits. So a marketing benefit to sort of saying, well, we've got, you know, the, the universe has just built its first passive house building um, using uh, cross-laminated timber. There's a lot of opportunity to grow a local industry in, in, in that area. Mm. Um, I have a question for the whole panel, whoever wants to take it up, and I guess it's about, um, we often think about equity, diversity, inclusion, we often think of, you know, the everyday, really, I guess, the, the workplace, the, the, the occasions where people are encountering discrimination often, or harassment, or um, where, where policy could be really helpful, but, so we're not necessarily thinking about the big institutional frameworks that frame and govern our professions. So what do you think the role or the possibilities for policy at the institutional level actually are? I mean, we've heard some specific examples here, but I mean, are you, are you optimistic or less optimistic about what those possibilities are? Do you want to start, Emily? I'm very optimistic. Um, you know, although I, I didn't exactly paint a rosy picture in the beginning, um, I think there have been some really significant changes. Um, I'll give you an example. So uh, the the video with AL and Simona, there was closed captioning, right? Uh, recently, we've been working with World Deaf Architects um, because they called us out. We were not including the um, the inclusions uh, and the accommodations that they needed to fully participate, and that's an inclusion issue, right? And so, um, at the national convention this past uh, summer making sure that every uh, general session had CART computer-assisted real-time um, 
translation. Uh, in addition to if you self-identify as deaf, deaf or hard of hearing uh, and you want the opportunity for a sign language uh, interpreter, you can have that. So, so we put the infrastructure, of course, there was a lot of hemming and hawing, it's gonna cost so much money, da, da, da. it's the right thing to do. You do not wanna be on the wrong side of this. So anyway, we, we implemented it. Um, two things happened. One, um, one of the challenges, and this is, this is in terms of identifying people and ticking the box, right? Um, you might self-identify as deaf and hard of hearing, but there's a lot of us who are hard of hearing who, who aren't really, haven't come to terms with identifying with that. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so that was actually very helpful for those who wouldn't necessarily tick the box, right? As well as those who are English as second language. Um, and uh, something that was a necessity for a certain group actually became a benefit for all. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's a larger metaphor. Um, in when we we recently did a code of ethics um, change, and this, these are the rules by which we all agree as practitioners to follow as members of the institute. Um, so there was two major ones. One was on sustainability, and that we have to actually have that conversation with every client. You you cannot double negative. You cannot not have that conversation. So that was one point. The second was that um, we redefined um, th what discrimination means and elevating it from a, a canon, something general, to an actual rule, an enforceable rule that you can be brought in front of um, the National Ethics Council for um, and, and what you could discriminate against, um, which is actually a lot larger than what the previous one had been. So by, by having those two things in place, we now have the teeth to have a larger conversation when offenses come up. And I think mm -hmm. um, the Me Too movement, Time's Up, all that fun stuff, has really um, challenged uh, what we thought were responses in place. And I'm gonna stop myself short, shortly. Um, you know, we didn't have a protocol in place until there was a problem. Mm. Until we had a situation where we needed to double check to see if a recognition was tied into a lot of talk or chatter about that. And um, we've done a deep dive with a consultant recently, thinking about what are the protocols that we need to have in place in terms of recognizing people. Because often when someone comes up for an award, um, it's only the, rec the recommendations of sort of their good work. And how can we create space and opportunity for those who might have a differing opinion mm -hmm. to then come forward? And I think ultimately we have to become a culture of reporting mm -hmm. and, and be able to listen and hear that reporting and, and know that that's not um, a detriment to us as an organization, that's actually a strength. And so there's been a lot of deep di <laughs> policy change that I never thought I'd be doing, mm. but good work. Mm. Anyone else want to take that one? I, I was just going to, just reflecting back on what I was saying before, I think often it's there's um, a very overt reaction to um, uh, you know, if we talk about diversity, you know, there's, there's in society we have people who, yeah, who don't understand or don't want to understand or haven't had the ability to be given the tools to understand. And then I think there's also those who might not have thought about it and so not necessarily right or wrong. And I think a lot of this stuff is just about education and the more... Um, we talk about it, the more we rely upon things, the more we have stuff written down and lines in the sand, the easier it becomes for us to sort of operate. And I think more, you know, that situation I was dealing with last year, it wasn't anyone's fault in particular, it just was something that had occurred through circumstance. And so, had, you know, and everyone was very happy to work together to write it, but um, it's, you know, these circumstances are the things that are going to trip us up. So how do we, you know, avoid being tripped up or, you know? Yeah. Mm. I think you're right, Naomi. I was thinking about the spectrum that you had earlier, um, whereas, you know, there's sort of the infancy, infancy like uh, infancy, I can't say that, um, where you don't even know there's a problem. In March, I was giving a presentation on the guides and a gentleman stood up and uh, said, you know, I don't see color. I don't understand why this is a problem. I don't see color. Mm -hmm. And we're all like, oh, God. <laughs> um, and then a gentleman stood up, and um, his children are mixed race. 
So he, he's, a, he's a white male and his children are mixed race. And he said, look, when my kids are with me, I want you to see their color. Because not seeing that denies their experience and what they identify as. And for me, it was a really powerful moment mm -hmm. um, because it illustrates sort of this, this dialect, which is there's a whole bunch of architect members who don't really think there's a problem mm -hmm. or, hey, it's not me, I'm not the bad guy. Mm -hmm. um, and really sort of saying, well, actually, <laughs> that in itself, that statement is an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, Natalie, when you were speaking earlier and you were talking about these large construction companies being gender blind, mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's such an interesting term, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because you could imagine someone saying, I'm gender blind. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? I don't mm -hmm. see gender. But as we know, you know, the difference between equity and equality is that sometimes if you treat everyone with total equality as in exactly the same, it ends up having inequitable effects. Mm -hmm. So you, one should not be gender blind because the world is not gender blind and the effects of gender you know, need to be called out and need to be um, addressed. So I think it's it's really interesting when an issue is, you know, so invisible and so ingrained and so encultured that it's not even showing up mm. in policy or anywhere else, certainly not in, mm. in, in what you're talking about with male leaders saying, that's just a non-issue. We don't even have to think about that. Yeah, and I think the other thing that came out of our research was that, um, you know, for policies to stick, well, firstly, I will say that the construction companies, human resources departments hated the word policy, which we found fascinating because <laughs> we're like, okay, formal rules. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so they, so I'm just... I'm just I was going to say, don't they have a safety policy? They do, but you know, they they see it as something that's a bit unattractive, so they'd rather use the term initiative. <laughs> but um, <laughs> just like value management, I'm like, I don't care, it's rules. Um, so to that point, one of the things that we found around why the policies didn't stick was that there really needed to be. Uh, well, there was a, a complete denial of their actual values um, and you know for policies to stick some of the research will say um, I'm taking from Vivian Lowndes from Birmingham University she's a public policy professor she sort of says you know policies for them to stick they have to be there has to be an alignment of values but there has to be also that enforcement like someone's got to care if you're going to break yeah. a rule or not and so it has to be tied to a sanction or a reward but what was really interesting is the policies that are out there in the field in gender equality, you know, that, you know, valued flexibility and part-time work. Well, in reality, what was valued in construction, the behaviours valued in construction, were long hours, total availability, practices of presenteeism. So there was a complete disconnect in terms of, you know, the, the policy and the practice, and that's why those policies really didn't stick. And the other thing I kind of felt was because they were being authored by people in head office who didn't um, there wasn't the revisability component. So the people from site weren't feeding back and saying, well, we've actually, on our site, we've tried this. And so, you know, to have that sort of leeway within the policy to, to tailor it um, and to also allow for innovation. There, th I have to say there just wasn't the um, stamina. Um, and part of that, I guess, to your point before of how um, positive, and it, you know, on one hand, I feel quite optimistic, strangely, mm. despite the fact of doing this research, but there is a good deal of resistance mm. um, and backlash in, in and it's, and it is that sort of behind the hands or, you know, undercutting, I sort of feel, um, that's at play here. But part of me thinks that we're on the right track because, you know, at least it's not indifference. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Mm. You know, it's backlash. So, they're, they're, people are feeling like, mm. you know, the status quo is being challenged. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I meant to add, um, agree. Yeah, yeah. The, it's it's a very positive um, outlook, I think, and you know, it's just you just got to be on notice. But I think it's a very positive outlook. Mm. Mm. What do you think in the landscape architecture profession? How's that looking? Ah, uh, I think. It's probably the thing that I've been most contacted about our our draft policy. Um, and I, I mean, I can't really talk about the effect. It's heavily informed by the two reports produced by Parla, but um, you know, um, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll have a lot of feedback on it and that'll help to make it stronger. We're, we've written it from the vantage point of not just about how, how can the policy influence AILA or its members, but how can our members also use it to affect um, you know, broader changes around them because 
I think what we've all acknowledged in our various discussions is that gender equity isn't going to happen just because we care about it or, you know, or that our professions care about it or that women care about it. it need, it's a systemic thing and it has to be addressed in the round. So um, that that's where, I, yeah, that that's what we've aimed at. It's to, we've placed it in language that will hopefully enable you to have a discussion with government, to have a discussion with putting my money hat on now with a client and to sort of say that, you know, I have you considered this because what you're doing is not in accordance with the, Insti the National Institute of Landscape Architects. Mm. Mm. So I'm going to ask one more question to the panel and then we're going to open to the floor. So start formulating your questions. Um, which is, what advice would you all, given your experiences, what advice would you give to others who are seeking to create change from the top, through <laughs> policy or otherwise? <laughs> None. There's I'm no like advice. filtering. <laughs> um, it requires a lot of patience. It requires being consistent. It requires saying it five times more than you want to. Um, yeah, it's, it's not for the... Uh, faint at heart um, at a board meeting in September oh my god a uh, board meeting at September something was coming up and there was a gentleman who's on the board with me and said you know I just don't understand why can't we just make this sort of a company why, why can't we just fix this in the firms why do we have to have a big policy change mm. and like just sometimes you want to beat your head over mm. but then okay so then the flip side of it is then you run into someone who has been in, who's new to the profession, and who, um, whose life has changed because of some of these policies. And then you realize it's worth it. Mm. Um, I want to make sure that every child, every future architect has the opportunity to be a part of this amazing profession. Mm. For me, that I have to keep that in mind and all of these little things that get in the way um, that just has to sort of go away. Sorry. I think you've just got to be creative and um, I think this morning someone said, you know, if you have to go in and be a hit squad like I've been doing as a bit of an academic activist of going in and speaking to the unions um, around, I mean, in construction it's so base, we, we're just even asking for female toilets on site. So, um, but just, you know, getting, hitting those soft spots and gaining that base of sort of that guerrilla team of senior leaders and influencers who will help you around um, to do that. Um, the other thing is to to make it a competition. So I noticed with the um, the New South Wales and Victoria um, government uh, cultural task force, we recently um, I drafted a um, proposal for the green building star, and um, straight away the chairperson there said, if any of the constructors don't construction companies don't sign up to this, well then I don't know what you're doing on this. Um, council. Well, all these big builders want to build for the government, so of course, over a long weekend, they all just signed up, and little do they know what they've really signed themselves up to. So I think, you know, that sort of pressure of, you know, creative pressure of competition is another way of getting around it. Yeah, I agree. I think speaking to the values of the people who are making those decisions, um, for ourselves it was, well, to be inclusive is to be leading. So, you know, every time we're sort of wanting to uh, introduce an idea, um, I, I guess, so this is what the university had on, but any time we're wanting to in introduce change or an idea, we'll benchmark it against, uh, you know, um, platforms that are world leading and, and use that as our sort of um, base um, from which to argue for change. Um, yeah, from a, I mean, uh, putting gender. If we talk about innovation, what we've raised. I mean, the institute, which has been, I think, as members, what we've been calling for for a really long time is, you know, policy advocacy and research, and the research supporting policy making, allowing us to then advocate. And I think that's being fully supported now by our um, CEO who came in at the beginning of the year. And so, um, what's really interesting about that space is talking through evidence-based 
you know, data. And I mean, you guys are very familiar with that, but the power of that means that we can then, um, you know, this Novation, National Novation Survey that we've done, we didn't know what was going to come out of it. Um, working also with ALA and PR so that we're, you know, we're not 11,000 members, we're 20,000 members, going into meetings with government, with the three organisations, not just us. Um, you know, not whinging, just talking, um, and also talking through um, data. And, you know, and just saying, I'm really sorry, but 71%, it's really likely that um, products are going to be um, substituted, which means that sustainability is going to drop. 59%, you're not going to be able to um, renegotiate your fee after you're novated. So there's something going on there. So all these, and it just allows you to have, a, you know, it's, it's a non-emotional conversation and it's just about, these are the facts, how can we fix it together? And I think that that's, that's sort of the approach that we're trying to take and collaborating rather than sort of saying, look, it's your problem. It's actually all of our problem. No one's winning, so how do we make it work together? And I think that's sort of something that we've been trying to do. Mm. I think we're going to open to questions from the floor. Does anyone have a question? There's a question. Thank you. Um, amazing. Well done. Um, Natalie, I've got a quick question for you. You just mentioned at the end that, you know, when you threatened um, the builders, if they didn't sign up... Then oh, I didn't. No, 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 not you threatened. No, you were talking about... The that, chairperson sorry. did. The chairperson. Yeah. Um, was that a man or a woman? But anyway. It was a female. That's yeah. brilliant. Um, I'm interested in just extending that a little bit to the Champions of Change policy. And I know that the Institute, um, when I was on National Council, was discussing Champions of Change. Um, I have a bit of a problem with Champions of Change in the sense that it's something you sign up to um, and you can advocate and say that we're doing all of this stuff. And I know that they're trying to bring it in to WA and I've gone to the firms that had Champions of Change, national firms, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll do it later. Um, I also know the CEO of um, uh, Gender Equity Task Force in, in WA. It's a, a funded organisation where big mining companies come in and they pay $30,000 to be part of it and then they do Champions of Change. The reality is, though, that when the firms are... I've, I've had letters from architects who are in different parts of Australia and they're talking about, yeah, Champions of Change is fantastic, but it's actually not filtering down. Um, and so it's not helping those middle-range architects of, you know, 35 to, to 50 or 45 that are wanting that flexibility. Do you have anything to say about that sort of... You know, is there a problem when we get people to sign up? Yay, because then I can be on the bandwagon, but, you know, is it actually happening and how do we um, quantify that? So that's for everybody. Phew, I thought I was going to have to make a comment on male <laughs> champions of change. <laughs> do you have gender parity in schools today? Uh, well, it, roughly. It's, I mean, Jill's the person to talk about this. It's been um, around about 40% women uh, and on the way up. 44. 44. Mm. Mm. Right, so I think... I guess we struggle with sort of the gold star type of thing where, um, you know, should we do a certification so people can challenge for it, et cetera, et cetera. I think um, we know that in U.S. culture there will be a minority majority. Um, uh, some project as uh, soon as 2060, um, but it's never really solved the gender issue because we've actually had parity in the schools for the last 25 years. And so how do you account for the fact that women actually leave? Um, Equity by Design in San Francisco found two pinch points between zero and three and 10 to 15. Um, and we knew that that was a huge work workplace culture issue, which is why, and I don't know anything about um, that initiative specifically, but, but understanding that focusing on the workplace helps to address the gender issue, but it doesn't address other systematic frameworks that are at play, especially with black or African-American architects, Latino, Asian-American, Native American architects. There's less than 200 um, licensed, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but that, that required different initiatives um, in the elementary and secondary education, as well as scholarships, as well as sort of other foundational issues that we had to um, tackle and so 
you know, I, I'm, I'm a fly on the wall on this one, but I think some of the initiatives that we see in terms of fixing firms doesn't address the systematic frameworks and the inequity at play in the larger culture. Um, I think you've probably summed it up. Um, I also think too that, um, to your point, you know, it's, it's as long as Mal Champions to Change isn't the silver bullet or seen as the one silver bullet, a bit like unconscious bias training was, that um, those male champions are going back to their um, companies and changing the structures and possibly even relinquishing their chair. Um, that's where I think the really interesting thing is, you know, who's willing to move out of that place of privilege um, and are they um, because... You know, it's 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 a slow move. I just think that there there needs to be a variety approach, not just one. And if the cost of doing one initiative is so extreme that you are unable to do others, then you know that that's questionable. Mm. It's maybe your question also um, opens this idea about virtue signalling, which is of course you know um, a, a term or a concept that tends to be used by people. Um, on the right to blame people on the left for being on their high horse and um, holier than thou and painful. But I guess also uh, the concept of virtue signalling is that you get all the credit and the benefits from being virtuous, um, but in fact it's not, you're not actually carrying it through. Um, I don't, that's not a question. Is there another <laughs> question? <laughs> it's a good comment. <laughs> Hello, I have a question. Um, I am from a regional city um, in Tasmania and we have a local um, women in architecture group and I'm on the National Committee for Gender Equity for um, the Australian Institute of Architects. And one of the things that we um, come across in conversation locally in the profession, which is um, a pretty active but small group of professionals in um, Tasmania, as you can imagine, with a smaller economy, but that um, things like um, flexibility in practice, um, part-time work, all of those things which um, generally support women but also other caregivers and other you know, um, professionals who may want to have some kind of flexible career but maintain their career, um, there's always uh, you know, negative kind of responses around that and feedback in terms of um, financial viability um, you know, running very small practices with often, you know, I think probably the biggest practice in Tasmania maybe has about 15 people in it. Um, so they're very small practices, they're really stretched and they're still competing for jobs that, you know, uh, mainland practices are also competing for. So we're, we're kind of, I suppose, stretched and doing government work and so forth. So um, Natalie, I suppose I'm interested to know, has there been any research done around the financial... Um, modelling and impacts and or benefits of, say, gender on the tender for consultancy tenders, not just construction tenders from government organisations and, and how that could be, um, I suppose, delivered. We, we, for example, we have um, in Tasmania, if you put a government submission in, um, you, there's a policy around violence against women, which you are signing up to, um, and that applies to consultants and also um, contractors for construction work. But there's nothing about, um, I suppose, practice sustainability and, um, and supporting, um, you know, different modes of practice. Can I ask you a return question? In your tenders, yeah. is there a, a way you can put an innovation component in? Sorry. Yes, yeah, there usually is. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I just know from anecdotal practice that's what others have been doing. So recently in New South Wales, um, a contract for a hospital was one where the contractor turned up with the, you know, uh, six-day week contract for the required time of the program. And um, she proceeded to say, here's your contract, that's the cost. However, do you understand the consequences of this contract? You know, you'll likely have um, a number of suicides, you'll have marriage breakdowns, blah, 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 went through the shopping list of it, and then said, and here's something I've prepared for you earlier, which is a five-day work week. Um, let's study it, because there is, I don't think there is the data in, in you know, to support you in that. Um, it's costing the client who is New South Wales Health $2 million more and taking them 10 weeks longer. But as a hospital and New South Wales Health, how can you, who provide services to men's health at a critical level, knock that back? And so they've brought in um, us as researchers and we'll be studying that. Um, so, 
you know, I think that one of the opportunities is um, maybe to offer it as an innovation component and maybe even suggest studying it. Because going back to your point, I think research is really important um, in terms of shifting um, the understanding around flexibility and, and outputs and, you know, the needs of um, the workforce. So. The Institute of Architects has actually drafted national procurement guidelines. I don't know if you've um, yeah, had a no. chance to have a look at those, but um, you know, I was part of the task force that was on that and um, brought obviously the client perspective to it. And we get a lot of feedback around, oh, you know, the tenders, consultant tenders take so much time to input to. And so in developing um, that aspect of the of the procurement guidelines, we actually looked at, well, how much information really needs to go in an EOI and also, you know, what is the, I guess, the the cost versus benefit because you're competing against so many more people in an EOI and we sort of said that, well, that should be capped at, you know, like 10 pages pre pre-established sort of content um, and not asking for too much tailored content. Um, and then, you know, as the tenders get uh, smaller in terms of the pool of architects that they're going out to, uh, that, that they might ask for more money and offer sometimes remuneration for, you know, where they're actually asking for quite a lot of, um, of uh, specialised content or, or customised content. So uh, I think the... I don't think we're near sort of really solving it. I'm not sure if that really kind of answers your question, but I think it's definitely on people's um, minds and uh, work is has commenced in a, in Australia. As far as I'm aware, it's still in draft form. Um, I, it's been sent out for comment. So to the, the, the Victorian Government Architects Office has endorsed it. The New South Wales Government Architects Office has endorsed it. Um, I'm not sure how much further it's gone at this stage. Um, yeah. We've certainly been active in Tasmania, taking it around to the relevant um, you know, um, government bodies and so forth with that document. Oh, I great. suppose it's really more about the actual, um, about less about the submission okay. process itself, but more about the actual job when you're doing it and mm -hmm. support, supporting um, small practices to achieve those um, flexible part-time working arrangements yeah, in, in I a think, competitive way. I think more work needs to be done there because uh, it's so emerging in terms of that mode of practice. And I know Simone Bliss Landscape Architects are doing quite a lot of, that. that's a practice that is um, modelled only on part-time work. Everyone in that practice only works four days or less. Um, they're pre I think they're all female or predominantly female um, and, and um, they, they're all, they all have flexible um, working hours. I think there's only one day when everyone is required in, uh, you know, to come into the office just so that they can have their sort of regular catch-ups and things. But I don't know of a lot of other practices who are doing that yet, but I think it will certainly start to catch on as we learn more and more about, you know, uh, uh, from, from pioneers like yourselves and like SBS LA, how we can all adopt a model like that and, and do it even better. Thank you. More questions? Just one here. If there isn't a question, I want to ask one of you. Hi, thank you all. And I love the uh, organization of this conference to have both the graf grassroots and the, from the top of panels in one day, you know, just before and after lunch. Um, this is not a fully formed question, but I want to um, um, speak about some government policy that you respond to. I know in the US um, we have um, recently reformed uh, overtime policy that you know, certainly affects architects and um, one of my favorite things to rally against is the fact of, I mean, I'm sorry to be talking this to you guys in Australia about this, but like we have no maternity leave. You know, we have horrible um, health and parental leave policies. We're like the worst. We're the worst. Or we're the second to the <laughs> or worst. Or the second to the worst. And, yeah. and the Family Medical Leave Act was a big deal in 1993 but it only, it only applies to firms that are over 50 people, and I believe still about 90% of architecture firms are less than 20 people. So most architects aren't even governed by this minimal law. So I know this is kind of, um, I mean, Emily, I'm sorry, you know, you're, you guys are in some ways powerless, you know, under, but uh, these are things that would disproportionately affect yeah. architects, and I wondered how 
in the Australian context, some of these labor laws, you know, sometimes push you or you push against them. I don't know whether I'm in a position to talk about gender in that capacity. I feel like I'd, I'd, I could talk about planning. <laughs> um, do you, would, yeah, I, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't, um, in my role, haven't come across that. But I don't know whether Justine could speak to that. One thing I'd say, um, I mean, I think we're in a slightly better position than the US, but I think the thing that um, Much better Australia has, which is really under-activated as an architect's award, there is a, you know, mandated minimum wage with standard working hours and overtime is to be recompensed at time and a half. So the award wage is very low, um, but we consistent. We know that there are, it's consistently underpaid. There are lots and lots of practices that still don't even pay the award wage. Now, um, it would seem to me that there, there's a kind of instrument there, which is often really it's really underutilised. It's underknown. Um, People, you know, lots of architects don't even seem to know it exists. Employer, employers constantly flout it. I would say to the credit of the Employer Association, the ACA, with which I sometimes, I mean, which, with which I work, so I should give you a little, you know, full disclaimer, but, you know, they, they um, argue very strongly against unpaid internships, um, you know, people not even following the most basic legal requirements. But we do have them. It's not a specially strong award. Um, we've also got a union, which seems to be entirely unstrong. Um, we have the architecture lobby starting up here. So there's a lot, which is fantastic. Um, so we do have some instruments that I think mm. are really underused and underutilised. Mm. And, um, you know, it would be great to see the Institute of Architects, for example, using yeah. its code of conduct in relation yeah. to the well, minimum requirements of the award yeah. Yeah. and starting to actually start policing. Yeah, sorry, of. what I meant by responding to your question was specifically government coming to us and obviously saying, this is what we're thinking of right now, what do you reckon, in a consultation mode. We've, they've never... In my role to date, they've never approached us in that regard. We've we've been talking to government about how to strengthen our Architects Act because it um, hasn't been reviewed for very many, for a, a very long time, and there's certainly some deficiencies within that act um, that we've been uh, working with the ARBV, the Registration Board, um, with you know, and campaigning to government over the last year. So, but in our capacity, we. Uh, in terms of the way that we operate, we've never had government come and talk to us specifically about um, wages and, and employment conditions from in terms of that being a conversation. But but there, look, there's certainly, there's certainly a, a set of policies yeah, that absolutely. could be better activated. Yeah, 100%. Um, and, 100%. Um, and I think, I mean, the complication that we have in Australia with the Architect Act is that we have one in each state. The so we don't have, have we, yeah, we don't have a national um, act, which is incredibly frustrating um, because it means that each state is operating in a different capacity. Mm -hmm. And it means that we also have less power to campaign federally because we've all got different acts. Um, yeah. The Architects Act's one thing, but the Architects Award is nationally yeah, sorry, you're fair right. work. Yep. You know, so that's, yep. that's a national minimum standard, and uh, we need to be holding practices to account against that as an mm. absolute minimum. Not as some sort of fancy thing you can do if you've actually got paid some fees lately. Anyway, I'm very got, opinionated got, about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe it's the last question. Mm. I didn't plan this, Amy, but I'm mm. going to put you on the spot. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> thinking about um, Emily's discussion about um, revision of the Code of Ethics at, mm. in the American Institute of Architects. Mm. In fact, that was something that we were planning, our research team was planning to assist the Australian mm. Institute of Architects with um, in our earlier research project. We never quite got around to it. Is mm. that... Could it be that the Australian Institute of Architects Code of Ethics or Code of Conduct, I can't quite remember what it's yeah, called. Yeah, Code of Conduct. Could be revised so that it is, um, at present, it's entirely gender blind. Is mm. it, could it be revised? Yeah, well, it's interesting. We're going through a process at the moment in terms of all of that being reviewed. And, um, you know, it's also to do with um, member behaviour. How do we actually behave? 
together. So all of that is reviewed, you know, in terms of the relationship between staff versus members in a membership organisation. How do we understand that landscape? So all of that's currently under review. And I think it's really interesting because I think as so many of these policies um, have overlaps and how can we make them all talk? And I think at the moment the failing that we've had in the past with the Institute policies is that they're not referencing each other. They're sort of cutting and pasting. And so um, one of the administration tasks that's you know, in hand at the moment is how we can have one policy here that references you know, all those other policies. So the you know, talking between policies, I think, is a very good point. Mm. Yep. Please join me in thanking Amy Muir, Jocelyn Chu, Natalie Gallier and Emily Gransdorf-Rice.